Okay, so Alex, can you tell me what your childhood was like? Well, I had a very, a very good, very happy childhood. It wasn't, it wasn't without its, uh, I guess, challenges or struggles. My dad died when I was very young, so I was raised. What did he die of? Oh, he died quite tragically in house fire. Oh wow! Like in your yeah. house, or um, yeah. Well, we were we were actually in Ireland at the time, and my dad was English, and he was a pilot, so he we weren't there at the time. He it was in the house in the UK. So oh. um, sorry, there's a bug flying around. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I I don't have any memory of my father at all. I w I was very young, and so my mom raised us by herself and was had never remarried and so it was i was a very kind of conscious ch or very aware child i was the only girl i have two brothers an older and a younger brother and so i was very aware of um of of her on her own and very kind of yeah so 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 it was it was very good we were very loved very and my mom was a lot of fun she was a young mom and my mom would uh my mom would have all the kids on the street in our house like a lot of the other moms on the road like they didn't want the other kids playing in the house because they didn't want to mess the house up but my mom was like she's she wasn't a particularly tidy or organized person that's where i did a lot of stuff actually um and so we had a lot of kids in my mom is is a big kid to be honest she's a real kid at heart and so we had a lot of people in just yeah fun a lot of fun a lot of fun and a lot of love um but it definitely had some yeah some some challenges growing up without a dad yeah he probably worked a lot, I would think, right? Because she was supporting you at the same time of. She did. She she, but she also qualified. She got a widow's pension. Okay. So she she really tried to be home for for us as much as as possible, you know, and and so we when my dad passed, she she did get like an, an insurance, so she we were able to have a home. So we had a a home so my mum didn't have you know a mortgage necessarily to pay but okay. uh, out, outside of that um she would have just been on a pension yeah she worked she did work part-time but she was really trying to be there a lot like i don't remember you know she, i didn't grow up without her being in the home she was very present very present in the home so we were very lucky that way we were lucky that um, she didn't have to work full time. So yeah, so I grew up very kind of aware and very, I guess, there, at the, you know, anytime my mom kind of fell sick or anything, I, there was always a worry in my mind that, you know, we could be left, like there wasn't anybody else to look after us. We did have obviously other relatives, but, you know, as a primary caregiver, yeah, so it was, a, it was certainly a worry in my mind, you know, that if she, that if something happened to my mom, that we would be on our own. So that was kind of in my mind, and I was quite conscious of her being on her own with us. My brothers, I think, were completely oblivious. <laughs> so I kind of felt a little bit like an adult in a way as a kid, and kind of assumed a lot of kind of adult responsibilities as well. And certainly, being the only girl, kind of did a lot more than my brothers would have done. They're just, yeah, they were just, but but a good, but you know. A very good, a very good childhood. You know, my mom was brilliant at encouraging. She poured, supported us in anything we wanted to do, any sports or the arts. She was very good that way and really supported us. So, so it was good. You know, we really, um, I, it, even though there was a tragedy quite early on, I never kind of felt like my life was lacking in that regard. I never kind of felt like I was losing out. That kind of didn't hit me actually until much later in life as an adult. It was it was kind of strange. But yeah, good, good, happy, happy childhood. Is there something your mom said to you that you still really remember vividly, like some advice she gave you or something she said? You, yeah, no, I, I thought about that question. In fact, your questions were very, very deep. I had to really think. I was like, whoa, that's not that's so I'm really glad that you sent them to me beforehand. Um, it sounds terrible that I don't remember stuff. <laughs> I'd probably think of a whole lot of stuff that she did say, but I, I have, a, I, it's actually a thought, a, a, um, a saying 
or a life principle that my granddad used to always say. And he would he would say to us, always be happy with a little less than what you have and you'll mm. always be happy, you know? So, so, so that always, um, I guess it just kind of instilled, you know, that there's always somebody who has less than you have. So be very, so be grateful. I think it, it certainly made me, uh, be a very, uh, live a life kind of very full of gratitude, you know, and to really, really focus on, you know, what we had as opposed to what we didn't have. And yeah, you know, that there's always somebody that you know that would was was in need more than us and so yeah so that that kind of always really stuck with me and then so i guess in a way that was kind of a proxy father thing you know because i guess my granddad was would have been the closest kind of paternal figure around that was my mom's my mom's dad so yeah do you spend a lot of time with you guys um yeah, he did. He tried to. Probably not as not as much as some other grandparents, but you know, we uh, we would go to see them a lot. My mom took us to see my grandparents a lot, and my granddad was. Um, I loved my grandparents, and my granddad was a great storyteller. He was a real, um, and he loved people, and he was really interested in all everything that our, his grandchildren were doing and always always had time for us, always spent a lot of time when we were there, giving us very one-on-one -on -one attention and and just really celebrated any, you know, anything we achieved, you know, even as little kids, he was really, um, yeah, just really encouraging. And like I say, a really a great storyteller and really loved by people who knew him as, you know, as a very warm, friendly. My mom is very like him actually. She's very like him in character. Yeah, so. What's your fondest memory as a child? Um, I would say definitely our Christmases. So we didn't get a lot throughout the year. We didn't, we didn't get pocket money. We didn't have a lot of, um, like a lot of other things like other kids were, were getting. Um, and we also kind of knew not to ask for too much because we knew the money wasn't really there. But my mom was, brilliant at Christmas time because throughout the year she would either they were like savings clubs that you could put money into you know each week and then you would have a, a lump sum to spend at Christmas so she absolutely spoiled us at Christmas time like she really went overboard um and so Christmas was always that sounds terrible I'm making it sound like <laughs> very materialistic we weren't materialistic really because we didn't have much so that so I guess it's part of that gratitude thing that you know when we got a lot kind of at one time in the year um yeah it was it was it was very magical and like I say my mom was a big kid so she really en enjoyed I think that part of of Christmas you know and and yeah. and really kind of spoiling us in that regard so definitely yeah our Christmases were were really great really really yeah. Is there a present you really liked? Oh gosh, um, presents I really liked. She got me <laughs> uh, roller skates. I got a really cool pair of roller skates. At the time, I wanted them to be more girly. My mom was quite practical. But <laughs> uh, years later, she got me this. The reason why I wasn't so crazy about them was because <laughs> she got me the same pair as she got my brother. <laughs> So I was like, mm. but you, I actually got a replica. I actually got a, a pair in an adult size because when I look back at them, I thought, no, they were, they were just this tan suede color yeah. with these red wheels and like red laces and they were very cool. So I actually, like I said, I got a replica made. Yeah. And a fabulous dolls pram and just beautiful, just yeah, I guess the, uh, well, I do have a story about a bike. Actually, she I wanted a bike and I wanted again a girly bike like my friends would have. You know, I did I, I didn't learn to le to ride a bike until I was much, much older than the, the rest of my friends. And then when I did learn, she did get me. I did get a bike one Christmas and it was a boy's bike. <laughs> It was a boy's bike. In my opinion, it was a boy's bike because it had one of those big banana seats, you know, and had like back brakes and it was this bright, bright, bright red. But it was actually a, a really cool bike because you could get two people on it. You know, oh, you wow. could get like, because I had those, you're, you're too young to remember, but it's those big, um, 
banana seats. So it was it was actually a very cool bike. It was a very cool bike. But I was a little disappointed Christmas morning. I was like, oh, I wanted a pink one, you know, with like girly things on the handles. But she was very practical too. So I can just imagine her in the shop thinking, oh, I'll get her this one because it's sturdier and it'll last longer. And it was a cool bike, you know, it was cool. So yeah, I guess those 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 presents presents really stick out in my mind. And the roller skates were fantastic because we lived across the road from a roller disco growing up. Oh wow. Okay. So we would go like we would go every Saturday. So it was great not having to pay for the skates. Once you brought your skates, you just had to pay your admission. So that was a super, you know, a really cool thing. So yeah, that's probably why the skates stick out in my mind so much because we use them so often. Yeah. So then thinking about all these different <clears throat> memories that you have and then all the things you've done now what do you think you would title your autobiography if you wrote one yeah you really stumped me on that one actually i was like oh my gosh i've uh, so, so kind of when i thought about it for a little bit the first thing that came to my mind was it's okay to say no <laughs> oh, it's okay. um because i think it's okay to say no and not feel guilty in brackets about it because I think growing up in as as a as a as a woman and also the type of mum I had and also uh, maybe kind of an Irish thing we never I just never learned that it was okay to say no to to a person and, and I think mm. that kind of affected me a bit in life and I. I think people are only really becoming a lot more aware about boundaries. And so I think, I think that would have been a really beneficial thing for me to have learned early in life. Mm. And my mom, my mom's the type of person that she, she feels so bad if she says, my mom feels like she has to, my mom likes to help the world. She likes to help everybody, but yeah. she never, never, she never puts herself first in any way and she mm. um she just will never say no to somebody and even if it kind of puts her out and she feel she would feel bad about it and and also and th and that's a good quality to have but that can kind of also leave you paying a price and so that kind of got passed on to me from her and I kind of found myself in situations where I kind of ended up kind of just kind of suffering a little bit by feeling like I couldn't say no. And, um, and so I've learned to embrace that, mm. um, later, later in life and, and to, to realize actually, no, it's actually a good thing to be able to do it and to do it in a, in a manner that's, um, you know, not, not kind of hurtful towards somebody. Um, yeah. so yeah, it's really a principle of boundaries, the principle of boundaries. And I think they're a really good thing to have. And I think it could be a little bit of a Catholic upbringing as well for her that, you know, there was, a, you just, yeah, I think we're as a society and certainly as a females, females, we're kind of, we kind of always have had this belief that you have to be nice all the time and you always have to oblige and that doesn't always serve you well. So mm -hmm. yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Do you think you've grown in that over the years? Or? Yeah, but much, much later in life. Only I'd say only the last couple of years. I'd say only the last two or three years oh, that wow. I've. Yeah, it was almost like that. You know, I had a discussion with somebody before, and it was almost like it was actually a counselor that I had had, and it was almost like I was given permission to have boundaries. You know, mm -hmm. and I and I realized, wow, I never felt that it was okay. You know, to to have to have that kind of protection for myself. So definitely it's something that's come much later in life for me. And it's, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a really good thing, you know? So, yeah. What do you love most about being alive? What do I love most about being alive? People, people. Yeah. Uh, people have taught me a lot and like your family or just people in general or family and also through performing it's been a, an amazing um it's been a, an amazing way to make connections with people mm. um i mean i can't imagine my life as well and what i love about life is performing you know um yeah performing was um 
it was a bit of a gift for me that came quite unexpectedly. I was a very shy kid, very, very shy kid and music and performing when I ended up doing it, not expecting the first time that I was on stage, that it actually had this real kind of release for me and this mm. freedom of expression and this um, sense of escapism as well that I, I guess in a way kind of made life a little bit more magical in a way. There was this kind of fantasy world, which I think kind of helped me um, in regards to kind of worrying a lot as a young kid. And like I was saying earlier on, I was quite um, conscientious and aware of our lives and, 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 and my mom. And so I think it provided, you know, this kind of just this magical kind of escape for me. And also I just, it was like I say, it was um, it was a freedom of expression. It was just like a vehicle for me to really express myself in a way I mm. I, I I couldn't as a as a shy kid. Yeah, it's kind of it's quite ironic, but yeah. So people, people and connections and and yeah, I mean, it's, I think that's what what being alive is about to to a big degree is is enjoying people and connections. So what, what would be the meaning of life for you then? Well, I think p becoming a parent really, really, um, was a big, was a big part of giving, I mean, I always had a purpose and I always, you know, f felt that I, there was, there was a lot for me to, I guess, enjoy a, about being alive, but Definitely having, having a child gave me a great sense of um, meaning in my life. Um, mm. I, and I think, <clears throat> I think, I think it's also, also about um, achieving our potential, you know, personally and becoming all that we can, growing as a person and um, kind of finding your own personal calling, you know, finding what you what really, rings true to your heart and um and also helping helping people you know life has its challenges it can be really difficult and so i think when we have experiences and we find a way to overcome them i think we can be a great strength to people because certainly other people have been a great strength to me when they've gone through different trials in life so i think we're here to certainly help each other through the journey of life and f fulfill our potential uh, as a person to grow and become strong as a person and to, to find whatever that personal calling is in life. Do you know what your potential looks like? Oh, what my potential looks like. Whoa, this is a tough one. What is, um, in 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 some ways i feel like i've reached my potential in some areas mm -hmm. um i think i'm enjoying kind of like another chapter in kind of mi midlife uh learning about other abilities that i have which really kind of got i had to tap into during covid yeah yeah really really had to kind of um get resourceful but i'm also I, I i've learned i'm also very resilient you know i'm very resilient and i'm very kind of good at adapting to to different things that happen in life and certainly i think that served me very well in being in this industry yeah. you know because you'll get a lot of rejection and you get a lot of disappointment and so it's never been something that has deterred me from pursuing you know a career you know and um yeah I, I i think i think that's i think i've yeah i think i've kind of start recognize those things and um yeah like i say during certainly during covid it made me very aware of um things things skills that i didn't ever have that i kind of realized oh actually i can do that I'm, uh, yeah, like I say, I'm quite, uh, 
resourceful and I'm good at adapting. Um, yeah. And I, once I kind of set my mind to something, I will, uh, I'll be pretty determined. I kind of, I, I don't give up easily. <laughs> so like singing wise, you think you're talking about like techniques you didn't know you could do, or is it more like different hobbies outside of singing? Uh, well, not necessarily, vo no, not necessarily vocal techniques, but okay. So for instance, um, during COVID, I, of course I, I had this space built to teach, um, teach singing lessons and have groups of children in here and to do drama with them, but I couldn't do that during at all during COVID. So I changed the space into basically like a TV studio and started doing, uh, virtual concerts. So I, I had no idea how to even use a mixing desk. And then I had to learn how to put a mixing desk through the, through the internet. And I had to uh, learn how to, you know, make videos. I had to learn how to do, um, just so many different things, digital marketing kind of skills, a lot of stuff like that, um, <clears throat> that I just had to basically teach myself through the help of a wonderful YouTube. So I just, and just my car, I realized that I could, that I could understand if I kind of stuck to something I could, I could understand it and apply it. And um, I'm quite kind of creative in a, in a kind of a craft, craft way. We've got, we're very, my, my family, my, my aunts and my mom, they're quite, although none of us, none of the rest of my family ever kind of were necessarily went into the music professionally were, were mm. that way. They're all very artistic. They're all quite crafty and good at art and good with their hands. And so I was, I'm good that way. So, yeah. So, so yeah, so I, I learned to kind of, uh, just tap into my ability, I guess, to learn you know, um, and to apply what I learned in a way that helped me, you know, stay afloat financially during yeah. two years. And Ireland was in lockdown for nearly about 18 months of those two years. So there was very, very little happening. And so, yeah, so, so stuff like that. So what makes life hard for you? Like, what's the one thing in life that you find discouraging in the sense of making life harder, less enjoyable? I think, I think for me, and I think for everyone that life is very difficult when you don't have understanding. Mm. So when you don't have understanding of other people, when you don't understand yourself, I think that can cause a lot of, um, I think it, yeah, I think it can just make life harder. You know, um, now understanding like people's situations or is it more of, but understanding people, understanding people, understanding why, why they act the way they do, why, uh, why we act the way we do personally. I think it's really important. So I, 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 I have a great interest in psychology. So I, I think it can be a great kind of, um, peace to understand ourselves and to I just think it helps us navigate life in an easier way and I think it allows us to extend compassion towards ourselves compassion more importantly towards other people because I think I think what causes people the most frustration and the most um strife is is getting along with other people you know and so I think understanding is, is, is a really key component to finding uh, um, um, a, an easier kind of way to navigate life. I think um, intolerance can make life very hard. Intolerance, you know, of um, other people's fates, um, um, cultures, or, you know, I think we live in a very intolerant time you know, and a, a bit of a, a push on um, not equal respect, you know, for, mm -hmm. for each other. Um, I think that makes life v very um, tragic in ways, you know, I think that we've, I, I, as, a, as a, as a race, as a, as a, I, I still think we have a very long way to come as in extending um, 
love and respect and equality towards each other, you know? So I think those things make life very hard. And like I say, for me personally, I think it's just, um, yeah, just getting along with people and, and that can, that's probably been, been my biggest frustration actually mm. more than anything. Yeah. The rest of the rest of the stuff that comes, I can handle, <laughs> you know, because we're, 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 you know, we're, we're always around people, you know, whether that be family or work situations or friends, that's the, to me, that's the toughest kind of path to navigate. So I think the more understanding we have the the, the easier, you know, it is. So, yeah. What do you, or like, what have you found so far the hardest to understand or like what you want to understand, but have yet to really reach there in your opinion? Like, is there something you really want to understand and you're trying to, or? Um, Oh, there's so many answers to that question. <laughs> wow, that's kind of multi-layered. Um, there's a lot of things come to mind, but I think, not that it's hard, but it's something I'm, one little thing that I'm still trying to kind of understand is, I think it can be hard to understand the the balance or the line between what is so let's say i don't know let's say you have an ambition or something that you know that you you want to achieve and maybe the doors keep getting closed closed to you all the time mm -hmm. i think sometimes for me i have kind of struggled with well is it is it is it because something in the universe or god is telling me no that's not the road i want you to go down or is it no just keep keep being determined keep pursuing it keep knocking on doors like when is it time that it's you know just time to give up on something or w when is yeah. it that you just need to kind of push through i think sometimes that can be that can be a challenge um for me personally as to kind of read the signs is it really not meant for you mm. you know and, and get the message that it's time to just let this thing be or should you just keep pursuing it like not giving up too early yeah, yeah? so yeah, I, I resonate with that that is hard to, uh, to yeah know. yeah yeah I, I think I think I think getting older you kind of learn to to read the signs a bit more on it you know and I, and I think certainly getting older I've tried to to really pay attention to my my, my gut you yeah. know um and of course there's so many so much kind of research now and scientific research about the good actually being the what is it the second brain and now they're saying that the heart that they're saying that they that there's um brain cells in, in the heart as well so yeah so yeah i think that's that's but that's been a kind of a, a little bit of a, a um a challenge for me in life and yeah and so i think i'm getting a bit better at it <laughs> what would you like to see changed if there's one thing you could pick in the world what would you like to see different? I definitely, like going back to what I was saying earlier on, I think, I think a reverence for the importance of every single being, mm. you know, just again, back to that tolerance, not non-judgmental, respect i think if we gosh how many wars would never have happened if we if we recognized the e divine equality between every single human being on the planet we wouldn't have racism we wouldn't have there'd be so many things we wouldn't have had i think mm -hmm. that would be one of the biggest changes if we as a as a as a as human humankind humankind as humanity recognize that we are all of the same individual worth and importance what a different world we would have eh? oh yes very much um yeah 
So you believe all people are completely equal. Yeah. Because they were created or is it just because they exist or it's a human life? Where do you, where do you get the value in the fact that people are all equal? equal because, because I do believe that we are all created by a divine God. Yeah. And that we are literally his, his, his spiritual sons and daughters. And that in his, and we all have that divine DNA in us mm. and that we all are equal in his sight. Um, yeah. Is there something in creation? I know you're talking about humanity, so maybe this, but is there something in creation that you really like speaks to you or an element of nature that kind of you feel like you transcends yourself that you think about and you're like, wow, that's really amazing. Um, uh, well, <clears throat> I've had this reoccurring dream of flying. So I'd have to say if it was nature, I'd definitely say sky and flight. I have all I, my whole life. I've had this recurring actual dream of being able to fly. Oh, wow. S yeah yeah I, and it's not it's not uncommon i know a lot of people fly in their dreams but i have the most amazing dreams of 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 flying and that just that euphoric feeling and that sense of freedom and so i'm convinced <laughs> people think i'm crazy but i'm convinced we actually can and will be able to fly by the power of our minds i don't think we need wings or anything like that but i think that's an ability that we we have and so, um, and so I have a little bit of an obsession with flight and, uh, yeah. So one of your other questions was if I, if there was a, if I was an animal, would absolutely be a bird. Yeah, for what sure. Kind of bird? Oh gosh. Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I guess I don't know what bird can fly the highest but maybe the highest whatever bird flies the highest so you're not afraid of heights at all then um i'm not afraid of heights as long as i'm um safe <laughs> um yeah i mean I'm, I'm realistic about it but um i would do a skydive yeah, I would. I be. I know that I'd be terrified. So I'd have to do one of the ones where I was obviously, you know, strapped to somebody's back. But yeah, I would yeah. do. I know I'd be terrified. I know that just that feeling of just falling out of that window. But yeah, I would. I would. Um, I would do that. Not parachute. Not parachute by myself. But okay. skydive and then With obviously. Somebody. Yes, a professional who's had no bad things happen, <laughs> but yeah. So, so I guess in nature, I mean, I love trees as well. I'm a, I, I, I mean, yeah, trees, but sky, yeah. Sky, the stars, definitely the sky is, 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 is my, um, yeah. And then it, it's, gee, how do you, how do you pick? I was brought up by the sea. So like I say, I live, we used to live across the road from the, a, a roller disco, but this, we were, literally across the road from the beach so i grew up around water and the ocean and so that's a place where when i go i feel very calm the sea not necessarily by a lake nothing like that it's just the sea i i feel very uh, at peace and very free uh yeah it's almost like a kind of return to like base you know it's yeah. like you know, just kind of return to like this neutral, grounded place. Yeah. Now, is skydiving something you haven't done yet that you want to do? Like I haven't. You... No, I haven't done it yet. Is that the thing you would pick to do if you had to pick one other thing to do that you haven't done? Um. No, no, probably not. I would like to. Um. So. I have this ambition to, I want to do a show 
I want to produce a show that um, is about Celtic mythology because we have the most amazing, fascinating wow. stories. Yeah. And I haven't actually seen anything necessarily done like what I'm thinking of. And I would like to make it a fully immersive experience through sound and vision. So have you ever been to these fully immersive experiences where it's like it, I went to one where it was all Van Gogh paintings? Have you yes. ever been to those? Yeah. That. So I want to do that as a show through music and sound so people you know, really feel that they're right in the heart of this music and this visual that would immersive be sensation, like, like literally, so it would almost like being in a, in a, inside in a movie. I, I would love to do something like that. Yeah. Love to, love to. Would you do it in Ireland or you'd want to do it somewhere else? Or? Um, I would do, I would look, I don't know where it would start. It would depend on, it would depend on who funded it. It would depend yeah. on the space. I, I think a lot of the location would come down to money and who the backers were. And, but it was, it's something that I would love to see be a touring production. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, and I, and I, I don't, I can't understand why someone hasn't done it yet. I think it would be such an incredible experience for, for people. Like I've seen yeah. a lot of visual stuff and sound stuff, but not something quite like what I have in mind. And also with the kind of theme, you know, yeah. of the, of the Celtic mythology. And there's some amazing, you know, it's kind of funny. I kind of think, why did, why did people even have to make up these stories about leprechauns? We have such fascinating mythology and the most amazing stories, you know, in Celtic kind of folklore. So uh, it's like, we've got even better stories than silly leprechauns because there is a reason why people, there is a reason why the leprechaun is, is, is kind of like the end part of, of, of a Celtic folklore way before that, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's some, that's something I'd, I would love to achieve. Yeah. Do you have a favorite Celtic story? Um, oh gosh, there's a lot of amazing stories. Uh, Tirna Nog is, is an amazing story. Um, the, uh, the Children of Lear has a beautiful message in it as well. Uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of different ones. A lot of different ones. Wait, watch this space, Hope maybe one day it'll, it'll happen. <laughs> what, and then um, I have one last question for you. What is the, so if you have a piece of music that you've sung, Mm. something you haven't sung yet that you think kind of encapsulates your life or who you are what would you pick you think that's a really really hard one i i i found that one really really difficult to answer um well I, i'll tell you what i have i kind of have two answers for you so if i was a musical instrument i would be a cello because if i couldn't sing i feel like the cello has this has a sound that is mm -hmm. the closest to how I express myself as a singer. Um, and there's a beautiful um, there's a beautiful Rachmaninoff piece um, from a movie called some. Well, it's featured in a movie called Somewhere in Time. Mm -hmm. it's, do you know it's got Christopher yeah. Reeve in and uh, Jane Seymour, and so that piece of music it's called Rhapsody on um, um, Pagnini, I think it is. That kind of I fell in love with that with that film and that that music, um, and I and I think I I I guess if it's if it's a personality thing, if you feel or you're kind of trying to answer what your your question is, I. I think I identify with it because without going into too many personal things, I've had kind of a lot of kind of um, not necessarily tragedies, but challenges, you know, that have that have been yeah. part of my life, but that there's still this beauty, you know, in 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 my life and they've had the most beautiful, amazing opportunities and just there's so I, so I guess it, it doesn't really describe my personality, but it's just like that, even though. Well, it's your story. Yeah. Yeah. Even though there's kind of been these, you know, 
tragedies and things, there's been a lot of, um, I guess I've tried to retain the positivity and the hope. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in life and in people. So I guess that's the closest I can give you as an answer for that <laughs> to that I question. I just have to look that up again because I last time I saw that movie was when I was in high school. Oh, the music in it is beautiful, and the story is just gorgeous, and they're both so. It's just such a pure, innocent love, and the lengths that he goes to when he, you know, falls in love with this woman. Yeah. Um, yeah it's just yeah it's gorgeous it's just really beautiful and you know and i i'm not necessarily into kind of romantic movies because sometimes i just think they're just a lot of uh, but there's just a beautiful <laughs> purity in that you know as i saw as a young girl so that kind of i guess stayed with me and i guess i kind of fell in love with the movie in a way more so than yeah but yeah, do look it up because the, the music is beautiful. And and the, the, the soundtrack is written by John John Barry, who has composed so many pieces that I love in, in lots of different movies. So the kind of mixture between the, the, the whole soundtrack mixed in with the Rachmaninoff music is is beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. OK, no, I, yeah, I will look it up because I would like to hear that again because I think what I remember most vividly about it was him staring at the painting and then he goes into it yeah 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 it's terrible and then he puts his hand in his pocket and he draws out the I don't know if it's a penny or a quarter or something that he forgot to take out because remember he has to have everything before he goes back yeah. in time he has to have everything from that time period and he doesn't realize and that takes him out of that moment and he goes back. It's so tragic. It's so tragic. But then she's there and she meets him when he goes into the afterlife. And so it's a beautiful reunion. But um, yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah, no, I agree. It's and he's and he's stunning. I mean, Christopher Reeve was just he's just so gorgeous in it. He's just so earnest and sincere and kind of boy like as well and yeah really nice it's beautiful yeah i agree with you though i kind of like sad endings i mean not like tragically sad but i think there's i think life is a mixture of both and so things don't always work out completely as you plan and so i think it's oh they never do yeah they never do. Well, that's the thing. He doesn't end up with her. He waits years and years and years. She ends up, they never actually end up until death, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, 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 there's, there is a kind of a tragic and kind of happy ending, but yeah, exactly. Life, life. I don't think I've ever met a person, you know, where you say to them, has your life turned out how you thought it would be? And they'll go, no never have i ever yeah. met a person for for good and for bad reasons you know but you're you know that's it's 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 really learning how to how to find find what works for you in life to help you navigate navigate it you know and just to still find hope and understanding in the midst of tragedy you know yeah. yeah so well i mean i thank you for doing this when you're so late at night there oh no worries no worries no worries and you look so nice all put together still at 10 30 i do not look that way well i'm only no no the only reason i'm like this is because i was ready for half five <laughs> and i was like well at least i don't have to get ready i'm ready now <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I'm going to just, yeah, stop this really quickly.